So uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, today's uh, seminar speaker, Dr. Jerry Wallace. But before we get started, uh, we do have uh, two special guests. Uh, I'd like to uh, recognize them, Tina and Madeline. Would you just raise your hands? Yeah. So Jerry's wife and uh, his daughter. So thank you for being here. Um, you know, the, uh, we scaled up this program this year to about double the size, 200 students. And that would not be possible without our key sponsors. And the BAE Systems is one of our platinum sponsors. And uh, without their support, we would not have been able to scale up the program this year. So thank you, Jerry. And <laughs> So just a, just a quick introduction. We sent, the, sent out the abstract, so hopefully you all read it. Uh, but Jerry is the, uh, is the uh, vice president and general manager of BAE Systems Fast Labs. Uh, before that, uh, he was the director at Alpha Tech, uh, which was a spin out from uh, MIT, and uh, before he was acquired by BAE. Uh, Jerry has a degree from uh, University of Kansas, and his uh, master's and PhD from MIT aero, uh, Astro and, and Aeronautical Engineering. So with that, Jerry. All right, thank you, Bob. It's great to be back on campus. Um, I will say that uh, I'll make a few jokes. I used to sit in this lecture hall before you were all born. Uh, it is a little unsettling uh, to think how time uh, has been flying by. Uh, it's certainly great to be a sponsor of the MIT uh, Beaverworks uh, Summer Institute. Uh, I attended the last session. Uh, I don't know if Kyle is still in the room or not. Um, there he is. I was uh, taken aback with the knowledge of uh, what I heard from you already. Uh, and I'm going to weave that in. And in fact, you're going to see a lot of uh, what's on uh, the chalkboard here. I will not be using chalk. So I intend to stay very, very clean. Uh, relative to that. So uh, work for BA Systems, uh, just a show of hands, how many people have heard of BA Systems? Wow, that's pretty good. Um, so, and I work in the R&D, so I'm responsible for all R&D in the US uh, today. And we're very fortunate, we get to solve uh, some incredible uh, challenges for our nation. And often, we, these are new to the world technologies that have never been solved before, and what you're gonna hear about is that we actually do this often decades ahead of the commercial R&D market. One of those technologies we're gonna talk about is autonomy and autonomy for UAVs. So to get the ball rolling, um, there is no formal definition of autonomy. So for the purposes of this briefing, I have what I call a working definition, and we are talking about autonomous uh, uh, control uh, for unmanned aerial vehicles capable of doing navigation and achieving mission objectives without remote pilot control. And the key point here is that achieving mission objectives. It's much more than navigation what we're going to talk about. I've got a couple of examples. In 1998, the RQ-4 uh, Global Hawk first flew. Uh, to date, we are talking 400,000 uh, flight hours since. 
in 2002, uh, and I'll talk about this program a lot more, the X-45 Unmanned Combat Air Vehicle uh, first flew. This was a team of UAVs focused on doing a common mission as a swarm. And then more uh, uh, pertinent to this group is the MIT Lincoln Lab Perdix. Uh, we are talking uh, 100 vehicles that self-organized, again, going after a common uh, mission objective. So let me ask a question. Can someone guess when was the first autonomous UAV flight in the history of the world? Someone's got to guess. 1998. 1998. Okay, RQ4, go ahead. Uh, 1780. 1780 before flight. <laughs> before, so 1903. There's a hot air balloon in France. It was just animals, no people. Okay. All right. <laughs> you got me. You got me. I'm thinking mechanical flight, but you're 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 on you're on target. You're going down the right path. Go ahead. 1940s. 1940s or World War II. Go ahead. 1960s. 1960s. Yes. Uh, 1930s. 1930s. This is like Price is Right for those. That, yes. Go ahead. Cold War era. Go ahead. 1959, all right. How about 1918? 15 years after the Wright brothers first flew. We are talking World War I, the Kettering bug. So you can go to Dayton, Ohio, to the Air Force uh, Museum, and you can see this to this day. This was capable of flying uh, 40 miles, Right? And, the, and it was never actually used in combat, but the idea was is that they would be able to understand the wind conditions, the disturbances we were talking about, and it had a gyroscope. And, the, and what they did is they essentially miniaturized the gyroscopes from battleships and put them onto what was the precursor to the cruise missiles of today. So how did they do this? Right? Artificial intelligence, which you hear all the news, right, was coined in the 50s but we're talking 15 years after first flight. How did they do this? Well, the last session said, very clearly, feedback control. So as a pioneer of autonomy for teams of UAVs, I found myself briefing senior leadership in the military about this exciting new technology in the early 2000s. And what I came to learn is that senior leaders do not understand feedback control. They've actually, most of them had never heard of it. And we're talking pilots that are now general officers that didn't realize that feedback control was in every single aircraft. They actually thought they flew the aircraft. Um, they are just a recommendation to flight. And so what this led this to is I got a recommendation from one of the senior advisors that I was working with is that, hey, you've got to start educating senior leaders on what feedback control is. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the slides that I have, I used to brief on a very regular basis over 15 years ago to the senior leaders of this nation relative to uh, national security. And I had to start off with feedback control and guess what, everyone's got one, All right? So feedback control, actually, the, the, the human mind is the most sophisticated feedback controller out there. Next, I had to go to a slightly different variation to the history of it. The first recorded mechanical feedback control system was 50 years after Alexander the Great died. So essentially, feedback control has always been part of every advancement that we've had. Next, I show, and, I, and, I, and we struggled to come up with an example that everyone could understand. The last session talked about the cruise control of the car. I chose the home thermostat because everyone lives in a home or an apartment, and everyone sets the temperature. Well, Honeywell developed this first one and sold it in mass market right, right after the Civil War. Because before then, they had humans controlling uh, essentially the airflow and the fuel uh, for furnaces. So now let's go to military and flight. So the first autopilot wasn't the Kettering bug. It was before that. And this was the Sparing Corporation. And they worked on miniaturizing. They dealt, uh, dealt with gyroscopes for battleships. Well, William Sperry, the son of Elmer, miniaturized it. And he put this on a biplane and flew this 
and it was a wing leveler. So the idea is if the aircraft got rocked that way, the gyroscopes would create the air signal and bring it back. Did this for the first time in 1912 outside Paris, before there was a Paris air show. Now, during World War II, as our aircraft went flyer that flew higher and faster, our ability and the performance of this, what we call flying qualities, and that is that, trans that, that response post-disturbance or inputs from the commands became more and more challenging. So they came up with control augmentation. Originally, it was all analog, right? Spring mass dampeners, literally spring mass dampers, right? Attached to these uh, sticks. As we started to go to higher and higher performance aircraft, and we went to relaxed stability aircraft, such as the F-16, or aircraft that were designed not for aerodynamics, but for electromagnetic radiation, such as the, uh, the F-117, it required fly-by-wire. And that became the stability augmentation. So these aircraft are, are, by design, unstable. So with that, I had to actually give them an example of how it works. So here it is. This is my house in Arlington. This is, happens to be my oldest daughter. And I'm out shoveling snow. And as uh, Kyle mentioned last time, right, I want to keep my house around 68 degrees. My inside temperature is what I'm measuring, and that's what I care about. The outside, however, is fluctuating, right, because it's winter. Right? And there's winds and it fluctuates. So this thermostat does a constant measurement and it does it through a thermal couple that happens to be integrated on the circuit board of that thermometer. But my daughter keeps opening up my front door. All right? And so as she opens up that front door, the temperature in the house drops. The controller in that thermostat measures that drops, that air function, and sends a low voltage signal to the furnace to turn on. That furnace turns on, it adds heat to the house, and it will continue this process of measurement and determining what the temperature is until that house arrives at 68 degrees. At that point, it will send a low voltage signal to the furnace to shut off. So I'm going to now do exactly what Kyle did prior and map this to the classical control problem. And you will see we almost have exactly the same variables that were defined. My house right, is called a plant or a process. Right? This is the historical term for that. My desire for my inside temperature, right, is called the performance metric. The fact that the temperature fluctuates is called a disturbance. Kyle used D, right? I'm using the terminology of a W. Um, the fact that there's a thermal couple, couple measuring that, right, that is a sensor, and it generates an observation. That observation is not the true temperature of the house. It is a noisy estimate of that. And the furnace is an effector. Right? also known as, uh, and this could be a control surface on an aircraft, and it has an input called the control. The thermostat actually has an estimator on it. It takes those noisy data, generates the best estimate of what the temperature is of the house, and puts that into a controller. And that's all based upon a desired performance. That's the 68 degrees that I set the thermostat to. And this process goes over and over and over. So feedback control. It does continuous measurement and response. The benefits of it, and this is a little uh, something additional to what Kyle was highlighting, you have the human factor side of this, of what they will refer to as the dull, the uh, dirty, and the dangerous. But on the right side, when you take a feedback control course, when you get to undergrad, you're going to learn about these four very critical parameters. Uh, it has to deal with disturbances and performance. So my house, that thermostat works in my house, but it works in every other house, even though those houses are different than mine. And that's called plant variation. That thermostat works in all hemispheres, all different temperatures, all different seasons, day and night. right? And that is the environmental disturbances. Now, on the performance side, feedback control reduces steady state errors. When I ask my thermostat to bring my house to 68 degrees, it doesn't bring it to 75 and stop. It doesn't bring it to 66 uh, uh, and stop. It brings it to 68 degrees, and that's called steady state error. And finally, what Kyle was talking about is that response of how quickly it gets there and whether it doesn't overshoot and how it settles down. That's called the transient response. So theoretically proven properties of feedback control that you will learn, uh, so I, I, I was amazed to hear that some of you have already learned that. Uh, but this is what you would learn from your undergraduate uh, feedback and control course. So now the question is, back to autonomous UAVs that are teams, how does this classical control problem map? 
So I'll take my effectors, my uh, plant, and my sensors, and we're now just take a look at a single UAV. So the plant and process is that vehicle, and the effectors and sensors are the subset of avionics on that aircraft that form what's called a mission system. So I apologize for the acronyms, VMS, Vehicle Management System, that think of this as the most sophisticated autopilot you have. You give it waypoints and it knows how to do that, take off and land. You have a variety of sensors, electronic warfare, radar, electro-optical, IR, someone mentioned in the last one, LIDAR. These are all potential sensors. You may or may not have weapons, uh, but you'll certainly have what's called uh, communications, navigation, and identification, CNI. So with that vehicle, again, we're focused on teams. And we've got to realize that this team is actually operating in this broader networked battle space with a lot of other stuff. That is the plant and process that I'm going to be talking about in my presentation. A team of UAVs all integrated into the battle space. So the measurement performance here isn't the, here's the temperature of the house. When it comes to military applications is, did I find what I was supposed to find? Did I neutralize what I was supposed to neutralize? Right? Did I collide with something? Did I hit something? Did I get shot down? And then the disturbances is just the fact of life of the art of war and the uncertainty. They call it the fog of war. Nothing certain. And there is a commander. This is one thing. Uh, we could talk fully autonomous, but there is someone somewhere in the battle space that is saying, I want this system to go do this. You have measurements. You have measurements coming from the UAVs themselves. Um, you have all this data being collected from all around the world. It's partial, it's noisy, and it's what's called latent. It's not all at the same time. And ultimately, for autonomous UAVs, you have to tell that where to go, what to do, when, why. Those are the type of commands. And so then you have essentially your estimator you take all of this noisy data and you need to put this into a common representation, your best guess of what we call the common operating picture, and it needs to go to a controller to determine where they should go, what they should go do, and why. Now, in warfare, it's a little more complicated than the home thermostat with the fact that you have an adversary, and this adversary is trying, that has their own mission, and they're trying to prevent you from doing your own mission. So one of the things that we've learned is that going all the, way, all the way back to uh, Sun Tzu, is that if you close the loop faster than your enemy, if you can make decisions faster than your enemy, it's called the OODA loop, then their responses, right, look static within your planning window, and you can actually solve what's called a time scale separation, and you can solve purely the classical control problem. So this is, in fact, the control problem that when I graduated from MIT, January 2000, I went to the st uh, small startup company to go solve. And in, in essence, I was trained as a flight control engineer. And if you come to MIT and you study flight controls, right, as part of, uh, if you're an aero and do unified, uh, or if you're in the electrical, course six, and you take uh, a course in flight controls, you'll learn that, as was discussed earlier, there's many loops that operate today on an aircraft. The stability augmentation loop today uh, allows unstable aircraft to be stable, right? That's the SAS loop. Uh, the next is a control augmentation loop. Um, this supports handling qualities, but as well as prevents pilots from harming their own aircraft. In an F-16 without this loop, if a, if a pilot put a big command into that side stick, they could actually rip the wings right off the aircraft. So what the uh, uh, CAST system does is it takes those inputs and says, ah, I'm not going to do that. And it puts in a modified input. An autopilot is also known as navigation augmentation system. So the problem that we set out to go solve was the next logical loop to be closed in military aviation called the mission effectiveness augmentation system. Uh, benefits, single vehicle to uh, large teams, um, variable level of autonomy. The operator could go in there and say, I do not want a single plan to go to one of these UAVs unless I pre-approve it to fully autonomous operations. It's whatever the operator says that they want to do. And then finally, it enhances uh, situational awareness and it is an optimization problem. And this is, was a, a really big disconnect uh, I would offer that still exists to this day. Uh, this is not a script 
In the last session, they talked, you talked about open loop feedback control. This is a continuous feedback and a continuous optimization. The objective function that you're trying to optimize is your allied force's performance, and you're trying to minimize your adversary's performance. The type of decisions that have to be made in real time, what, what activities need to be performed, when, right, what is the order, right, and the sequence, which asset, right, how. Sensors have a lot of different modes. They require their own special controls, and where. Um, you need to do all this while flying at very fast speeds. Cannot violate the miracle of flight. You have to ensure that you do not hit each other. And I should note, you're being shot at. Pretty tough problem, huh? A little different than autonomous cars on the, on the roads. So how do we solve the problem? So, so far I've talked about feedback control. If you talk to most people today, they would say the only way to solve the problem is using artificial intelligence and machine learning. How many people have heard of artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? All right. They've got commercials on this, right? And this is what you hear. This is the only way to solve the problem. So I'm going to pause here and tell you about um, now I'm going to go back in the Wayback Machine. It's 1999, and I'm finishing up my, my PhD. So I got a PhD in uh, estimation and control here at MIT. And I was doing reconfigurable flight controls for tailless fighters. And these advanced algorithms were flying uh, at Edwards Air Force Base. It was what was deemed a mature technology right when I was graduating, perfect timing. And I was supposed to go back to my employer, the Boeing Company in St. Louis and going to go work on this exciting new program called the X-45 Unmanned Combat Air Vehicle as a flight control engineer. But I knew that that wasn't where the exciting was, so I started looking at what's the next exciting problem, and it was, where are these vehicles going to fly and what are they going to do? So I started poking around, and I was told, don't worry, the problem's solved. Because DARPA and the Air Force had spent very large investments in the 80s and 90s in a program called the Pilot Associate Program, and there was a follow-on rotor pilot associate program, and it was a what we call a expert system. And I started looking at that, and I was like, I don't see how that's going to work. And the more I thought about it, I was like, actually, you're going to need a control paradigm to solve this problem. But everyone else was going a different direction, including my current employer. So what did I do? I quit, and I went and joined AlphaTech. And AlphaCheck already had a, a tremendous reputation in doing the uh, situational awareness. They had uh, been doing this since they formed the company, and they were considered one of the best companies in all of industry doing the fusion and correlation of data. Um, and then in 2001, uh, or 2000, excuse me, I joined AlphaTech and started the control portion of this and uh, subsequently coined the mission effectiveness augmentation system. So to put this in context, I won my first contract to do multi-vehicle autonomous distributed control in 2001, right, 2001. And ever since, uh, we have had a team working on this uh, consecutively. So we didn't do artificial intelligence. What we did is control and estimation theory. And we closed this loop very successfully using these technologies. There is a role, however, for artificial intelligence. And we started looking at this as the machine learning and some of the ex, uh, expertise uh, got more sophisticated, we actually started expanding our architecture of MIAS to include um, artificial intelligence. And we're, we're using the features that it is very good at pattern matching, it's very good at anomaly detection. With that, you can do patterns of life, and then you can do left of event. And if you could do that, you can enhance your situational awareness and alter your control strategies based upon very long-term learning and observations of what's going on in the battle space. It, however, will not replace control and estimation in this loop, right, for safety and performance reasons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into a couple of these topic areas very, very quickly, and I'm going to use, I apologize right now, there's a lot of acronyms here, but I just want to give you sort of a flavor of the state of the art for this technology. This is a problem that we've been working for 20 years now. So on the estimation side, uh, if you take a look here, 
Um, you gotta do tracking and fusion for a single sensor, then you've gotta do that across multiple sensors, then you gotta do that across multiple aircraft, and then you gotta do that across the entire battle space. And so if you take a look here, just doing this for um, motion target indication that you get out of MTI, that you get out of a radar, is a highly, highly complex problem. To take full motion video and do feature extraction based upon the pixels that you see in that and then stitch frames together to understand that that is a aircraft moving in the sky, extremely complicated, challenging problem. And then to do this across multiple vehicles that have their own representations of the world, but you gotta bring it into a common view to let alone integrating with data that was collected three weeks ago. Right? That is the basis of the situational uh, awareness problem. And so within this problem, which in just this one block, this is a highly complex architecture using the most advanced estimation theory that exists today. And again, this is an area that has been worked on. On the left side of this, these are all of the different types of sensor reports, either raw data or available on the internet today that we work with. And the fundamental technologies, multiple hypothesis tracking, graphical methods, probabilistic reasoning. On the control side, you need to be able to control an individual sensor to the platform, to a constellation, to essentially multi-day uh, um, an engagement. So if you look at this uh, again, even if you have a sensor, a sensor needs to be controlled. If you're on a vehicle and you want to take an image over here, you have to tell this sensor how to take an image over here. The aircraft is flying, it's moving, the sensor's moving. And there's all these feedback loops that are already in that sensor, but you, now you need to coordinate all of the sensors across. Um, you, we have solved this problem where it's centralized in a ground station and everything gets pumped up, but we started the problem actually in the air on board the aircraft with noisy, partial, bad communication links. And the philosophy was start with the hardest problem first and then make it easier. If you ever start with the easy problem and try to grow it from there, you may never get there. And this has been extended all the way up to uh, command and control. So what technologies? We talked PID. Proportional, proportional integral uh, derivative uh, control, most common controller. This is a little more sophisticated. Uh, so stochastic dynamic programming, stochastic optimization, model predictive control are just some of the different control techniques being used uh, to solve this problem. And now on to the learning side. So uh, pattern discovery, event learning, behavioral characterization ultimately to determine left of event to become a predictive ability on what the adversary is doing. And so this is where there is tremendous opportunity. And historically, right, people with control and estimation backgrounds and AI backgrounds, right, they actually have a separated on campus here, right? It's oil and water. And so we are working, and we're not there yet, to, try to bring them together for the first time in this type of a, a problem context, and it's very, very difficult. We say completely different terminology. Um, but if you take a look here, there's a tremendous capability because you can look at data for like the last year and learn and determine features that you would otherwise, your estimator by itself would never achieve. So the final slide, um, to open this up for questions, so where are we headed? So the first thing I would highlight is that we have largely done this for aircraft. We've done this for rotorcraft but we've done very little of this for ground vehicles, uh, some of it for underwater vehicles, and none of it for space vehicles. But the reality is, is that that is what matters today. So doing this and expanding this across all domains from space to undersea is one, one focus area for us. Um, we historically control uh, dozens, uh, up to three dozen, four dozen uh, aircraft uh, at a time. We're looking to take this to hundreds to a thousand. Right, the Perdix was 100 um, by itself. Uh, game theoretic for formulation. So we basically said if we could close this loop faster than the adversary, right, then we didn't have to solve the game theoretic problem because they became static within our planning cycle. The reality is, is we do need to worry about uh, the adversaries uh, to democracy uh, developing technology like this. They're very smart. 
So we do want to return uh, to the game theoretic formulation. It is probably the most difficult problem out there in control theory that is still to this day unsolved. Um, cyber resilience, this is all very data and model intense. Um, if someone goes and screws with your models, right, they'll screw with your solution. And then uh, finally, uh, verification and validation. So anytime there's been a major advancement in aviation, you had to come forward and find a way to test. You cannot test every disturbance. We never have tested every disturbance in aviation. We have figured out which flight test should be conducted to give us the confidence to allow all the passengers to get on commercial airliners or let alone the, uh, the uh, women and men to get into the cockpit of the fighters. This needs to be repeated and it hasn't yet to this day. So with that, I thank you and uh, take some questions. Yes. Do you think the benefits of artificial intelligence when applied to aircraft outweigh the risks? And what are they if the benefits are any? So, so I think that uh, you have, it depends on what problem you're talking about, right? Um, so if, if, I, if I just take a commercial airliner, and if I take a look, they've got extremely sophisticated uh, navigation systems on those today. If, if you fly from Boston to Tokyo on that new uh, uh, 787, the amount of time that a pilot's actually like has their hands on something is probably uh, um, 1% or less. Because the navigation, the 4D navigation system is, is, it can take, it can land, right? Whether or not they take off or not, but once you're up in the air, it's all computer. So I don't think you're gonna replace that, right? Because you have theoretical mathematics backing that performance, and you have uh, a flight testing. But having a decision aid, like the pilot associate program, in the cockpit, helping the workload of that pilot, I think makes a tremendous sense and could provide an opportunity for the airlines to cut down the amount of air crew that they've got to put in those aircraft. So that would be a great example of where I think artificial intelligence does uh, support aircraft. But in terms of tactics and how UAVs fly, I don't think that it will ever replace the power of that you get out of the estimation and control feedback loop. Yes? Singular value preparation. What are you actually separating from? Like, I didn't follow. So, so the timescale separation that we imposed here is that we were showing loop closures in less than a second uh, to seconds to minutes. And so if you have a constellation of aircraft, and you can completely reconfigure, right? A new piece of information comes in, or disturbance, or new knowledge. And if you can completely reconfigure your system in the order of minutes, and it takes your adversary on the order of hours to days to, to respond to that, you don't have to worry about their decision making that requires hours to days. That was the time scale separation. Good question. Yes. So uh, in terms of security, because especially a lot of these aircraft might have really uh, dangerous weapons, so in terms of making sure that whichever uh, program is controlling the aircraft, making sure that it's safe and it doesn't get uh, hacked or overridden or something, how do you sort of uh, take care of that to ensure that doesn't happen? So, so I'll suggest that uh, at a different scale, that problem has been solved. Think of cruise missiles. Think of uh, ballistic missiles. Right, we have been using cruise missiles, and a cruise missiles, uh, like it or not, is a UAV, right? And we have cruise missiles that are launched from aircraft. And so I'll say that there's analogies that already exist within uh, aviation today on how to handle the security side to ensure that someone doesn't take control of something that is you know, very dangerous, right? Or can be just turned around and hit uh, things that you don't want to hit. And so I would suggest that that's what we need to start, um, is that aviation has dealt with this issue for many, many years. So, yes. So assuming you run into the game theory problem that you are, is there any that are actually helped So, if you take a look. Game theory, the biggest example of game theory that I know that was solved was using AI, right, playing chess. 
right? So if you look at the closed form game theoretic solutions that exist today in the theory, um, it is non-polynomial hard, the hardest problem out there. We have no closed form solutions for that. Uh, the only problems we can solve closed form today are extremely small. They did use artificial intelligence very successfully, right, to beat a human playing chess. And that's why I say that there's a tremendous opportunity, but there needs to be a lot more focus on Right now you have, uh, if you look at the autonomous car people, you have the group of pure AI and you got the people who are doing model predictive control that are applying more uh, control paradigms to it. They, they are very fractured, right? So th the question is, can we ever bring these communities together to go solve that larger problem that today eludes uh, researchers? Yes. So it's, so we have to understand it's not an either or, right? The, the strengths of control and estimation is its mathematical foundation, and you can theoretically prove performance and um, oh, no, this word stability. Stability being if I have an inverted pendulum and I have a controller, that if there's a disturbance, I can return it back to that inverted pendulum. You can mathematically prove this, and what that allows you to do is you don't have to go test every situation, and you can prove safety. Now, what control and estimation can't do is large, uh, large quantities, large data. And uh, Bellman, um, famous, famous uh, control theorist, um, I believe it was around the late 50s, early 60s, uh, coined the curse of dimensionality. And control theory, as well as estimation theory, starts to break down the larger and larger problems. Well, that is exactly the sweet spot of artificial intelligence. They can handle tremendous data sets. And so that's where I look. So it's not an either or, I see complementary. Yes? Um, is the goal of the UAV, a, a UAV is to like, make the, uh, so like if you have two uh, UAVs who are each other's adversaries and they want to deoccupy each other's performance, the issues arise from that. So, uh, so if I had two UAVs, right, from our side, um, and they wanted to go do a mission, what you'll see is that an optimal mission isn't necessarily what the optimal mission is of one and then the optimal mission of the other. What we learned is you actually have to solve an integrated plan that accounts for the common mission objectives of both of them. And in fact, what you'll see is that, um, I'll use the word suboptimal, you end up with a pretty poor plan if you only look from a single, if you've got a team of UAVs, but you only focus on a single UAV and its performance, and then you look at the next UAV and its performance, right? You don't get a very good result. And in fact, if you want to rewind the clock, that was the real innovation that Alpha Tech did. We solved it as a combined optimization problem, not a one vehicle at a time problem. Yes. Yeah, so that is absolutely the game theoretic problem, and you desire to drive to what's called different saddle point conditions, right? And ultimately, that saddle point condition can be a draw, right? Or it's a victory for one side versus the other. So if you have literally the same system going at each other, you literally are playing chess now. And now you have to solve the game theoretic problem, which we have not solved. I had someone back up here. Here. I'm going to work my way back around, okay? I'll come back. Yes? How much computing power? Um, so, on um, systems like where I started on the X45, it's just a power PC. No rack of computers, no cl magical cloud. A power PC, and I don't know what that processing speed was back in 2000. What was it, 486? So you want to talk about, so, so in all honesty, you develop the greatest uh, uh, theory and algorithm and you implement that in code, but there is no system to run it, you really haven't done much in life. So this whole notion that you have to focus on an architecture that can run on the existing computation, comlinks, we went in immediately knowing that the comm links are poor, 
we weren't gonna get much availability, so we had to come up with the centralized control approaches that accounted for the fact of the reality. Um, so, uh, curse, curse of dimensionality, Bellman, I mentioned. The second curse that he highlights in his, uh, um, sort of his really his key, keynote book, was the curse of modeling. The more you can model, the more you wanna model. And so the theory that we applied, uh, the philosophy, I should say, that we applied to this problem is that you cannot count on Moore's law and computation growth because your desire for more fidelity in modeling increases. And what we found is we thought that they uh, increased at a commensurate rate. No, what we found is as Moore's law continued, and it did, the desire for fidelity increased higher. So our run times actually have been getting slower because the size of the problems and the fidelity we've been putting in have been getting, right? And these are the, these, these are the customers that say, I want more fidelity. So keep work. Uh, I had someone right here. All right, go ahead. Yeah, so great question. Quantum computing, have we looked, have we tried to implement that? Um, not yet. We are monitoring that. Um, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert in that area. Uh, the last time I looked into this about a year ago, the, the quantum computers were actually pretty big, right? Um, I need processors that, for an aircraft, right? So for the quadcopter, how big's your processor? About this big? Yeah. So we're talking, and for a large aircraft like an X-45, that's around a 60,000 pound gross takeoff weight, the C model, I just get a single board. And that board is about that big. That's it, right? Uh, Space Rover, how big is your processor? Yeah, about the same. Yeah. The 90s. Yeah. And it's a rad hard one to boot. Exactly. I think we produce it. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the reality is, is that Yes, we'll monitor those trends, but everything we do has to be uh, grounded in the realities of what we could actually go provide our military and our allies today. So, but a great question. Yes. See, do you foresee a conflict where a large scale autonomous UAV uh, fire planes could be used like World War III? All right, well, um, unfortun unfortunately, um, we should all be worried that that's where we end up someday. Um, the, the, the one thing about how many people are, read history? What is history books, right? Go back 2,000 years. What, how do the history books read? Right, it's repetitive and the big, some of the biggest events in those history books were discoveries of new lands or new things or warfare. It's as core, unfortunately, to human nature. Um, I will tell you I was on Capitol Hill two days ago um, at a Mitchell Institute, and they, they unveiled a paper talking about the opportunity that exists today for manned, unmanned teaming. Today, when we, uh, uh, there's an uh, airplane program called the JSF, the F-35. They're ramping up production. We don't have enough pilots. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna take perfectly good F-15s, F-16s, and F-18s, and they're gonna go park them in the desert, just like we have as a nation for, you know, ever since we've been uh, doing uh, modern aircraft, say in the 50s. This policy paper said the autonomy exists. Why not go put the autonomy in all these perfectly flying aircraft and scatter them all throughout the world as a deterrent? You don't have, need pilots, you don't need to fly them all the time. And if you're an adversary that wants to go across a democratically elected border, you have to now worry about every little F-15, 16, and 18 scattered throughout the world as a deterrent. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That, and that, that's the, the whole purpose of that policy paper was to highlight that 
we don't have enough pilots. So if we ever did get ourselves in a, a, a dilemma, right, as democratically elected uh, allies, we have a problem. We could not duplicate what the paper says is we could not duplicate what we did in Gulf War I today. Yes. So you're not training. That's, it's, uh, so in estimation and control, so you know PID, where we talked about the first thing, first step was, right, keep up in the gain until it starts, right, resonating, oscillating, for those that were in the last session. And the second thing was, is now put derivative control in to cut down on the oscillation. Um, so what, what you do for this is that, don't think of this as a uh, self-tuning system. Right. The way the scientists do this today is they implement the algorithms, they put the models in, and there are simulators, right? And they're called constructive simulators, just like you would do for uh, your first robotics. You're going to simulate. And first thing you do is you do the simulations in all, all computer code. The next thing you're going to do is you're actually going to go implement this in a safe environment, right? You go pick a big field, right, to go fly a UAV such that if it does go haywire, it doesn't hit anyone, right? Hit a house. Um, and so you build up that approach. And that is the approach that has been taken in uh, aerospace and defense um, you know, for quite a long time. So you would replicate that. But it is not the training set, right, or the tuning. It's way too complicated to think that you're going to tune it like, like we do today for PID controllers. Yes? No, you will absolutely pit the two sides against one another. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, Human targets? Um, I mean, that's that. So I would say that's a policy, political question, not a technical. Yeah. Technically. Right? I don't think that, I mean, it depends upon what you want to do, but uh, the technology uh, is quite advanced if policy and decision makers would ever want to do such a thing. That's not something that, that I have seen them wanting to do. Yes? That, uh, so I'm going to answer the second one, is that I will start off with the deterrent, right? And um, if you take a look at what happened to, do, do, you know, I know this was before uh, your time, the nuclear arms race, right? That ultimately became a deterrent-based strategy. And so I think that that's probably the realm we're in. Um, I hope that's the realm we're in, that this is just simply a deterrent. Uh, but what, one of the things the history books have shown over and over again is that uh, for those countries where the technology was available and they did not choose to use that as uh, uh, part of their arsenal and others did, they no longer became you know, a, uh, a world-leading country. Right? And so the history really does matter here. Now, I couldn't fully hear your second question. Oh, your first question. So UAVs, not the autonomous UAVs, but UAVs have been um, pretty much flying around the clock since 2000, right? They have been collecting, uh, they primer, you know, if you take a look at the RQ-4, Global Hawk that I showed, uh, 400,000 flight hours of collecting imagery and intelligence around the world. Go ahead. The autonomous ones? So the, the country, for the most part, has chosen not to field them. 
So we have, I mean, uh, MIT Lincoln Labs, how many years ago was it that you guys demonstrated Perdix? Uh, two, two, two years ago. So uh, for the fully autonomous ones, um, the country, um, for the most part, we've done programs over and over again, uh, then the programs get canceled. We demo it, we prove that we can do it, but I uh, wouldn't say that there is any large scale use um, in the military today for such technologies. Did I answer your question finally? All right. All right, how are we doing? One, a couple more? So when you add more UAV and then it starts to dimensionality, it starts to take effect, does it like, does computing power suddenly jump up or like, did the prediction become ineffective? Like where does the theory break down and why? So uh, computation power increases exponentially. Yeah. So what ends up happening is that the computer just sits there and runs. Right, and so uh, there is a whole body in uh, control and estimation theory where when you do this optimization search, you're in a feasible space so that you can say, time certain, stop it, and you still have a feasible plan. By no means can you uh, suggest that it's an optimal plan, right, or a near optimal plan. Um, there are other optimization approaches that uh, search in the infeasibility space. If it does not conclude, you do not have a solution. Yes. Do you foresee a model system going into humanoid robots and create sort of team of possibly special agents instead of sending actual humans? <laughs> well, so so I'll sit there. If 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 you can envision that, right? So you guys are going to be like, right, the brightest scientist in the world, like really soon, working. If you can envision it, and you've got the will to do it, then it will happen. <laughs> I think it's that simple. All right? Go ahead. Yeah, so for the aging fourth gen, no, I just want them sitting on a runway or in a hangar. And, and they hardly ever fly. But the thought that they could fly becomes the deterrent. Optical detection? Um, there are a yeah, so radar is radio frequency, right? You have the optical detections, you got the laser, the LIDARs. So there are so many sensors out there, right? Pick one or pick many. It doesn't really, I mean, your mission will di dictate the type of sensor and what you're going after, but there's a lot of different sensors to pick from. So for your quadcopter, you guys are uh, gonna use what? I heard the race car has LIDAR. Okay, all right, so uh, EOIR, right, electro-optical infrared. You're gonna use GPS, that's part of your CNI. Um, you, you ought to push them to get a low-cost radar. Um, oh, very nice, so right there, I mean, that, that in itself, that's a lot of sensors. For LIDARs on the, uh, uh, on the uh, car, right, that's a pretty sophisticated sensor. So a couple more. All right, so um, model predictive controller, are we trying to do this over the battle space? The answer is yes, all right? It's a non-polynomial hard problem, NP-hard. Even if we had an optimal solution, we couldn't prove that we had one, all right? So there is no, for these large complex problems, there's a theoretical optimal. You can't prove whether or not you got it. So you come up with, you apply the theory, you come up with a solution, and you implement it. Now, a model predictive control and then with a receding horizon, um, since you asked this, right, what you do is you generate a plan for a certain horizon. Let's say that this horizon is for the next 60 minutes, right? One minute in, 
you generate another plan for 60 minutes. One minute in, another plan for 60 minutes. Or you could do this from a complete event based, based upon the disturbance or the events in the battle space. Um, now within that optimization, to go one step further, there is a open loop optimization, and then there is a closed loop optimization. And in open loop optimization, you assume a, uh, uh, a maximum likelihood if you take a look at all the distribution of information that you, so you're planning on collecting sensor information, but you really don't know what the outcome of that is. So there's this distribution of different outcomes. In an open loop optimization, you're gonna say, no, this is the most probable, and this is the most probable, and this is most, most, most probable, and I'm gonna develop a plan. In a closed loop optimization, which is the most complex of all, is that you're doing an optimization over that entire distribution of what that sensor may see. And you're gonna do every single outcome a mapping to a different control decision. And you can see, again, right there, you're back to the curse of dimensionality. One, the final one. and going forward, do you think BAE is going to implement that? So um, for what, what I said is that that's not an area that we focused on, um, but I do see nuances. So um, if you're in a ground combat vehicle or, uh, you know, take a, uh, uh, the Land Rover, right? In the airborne environment, if I'm up at altitude, it's air. What am I worried about? Other aircraft. I fly above birds, right? I wanna make sure I don't hit other aircraft and I wanna make sure that something from the ground or the air doesn't hit me. When you're on the ground, you have no idea where all the trees are, where all the stumps are. This notion of uh, mobility and train, and the fact is if I get myself into a situation, I can't necessarily, for some of these vehicles, go in the exact reverse. I have to execute a maneuver. There's these type of complexities. Now, I will tell you, BA Systems, in fact, did develop a fully autonomous combat vehicle back in the same time frame as the uh, X-45. Army didn't want to buy it, right? Um, I don't know if any of the BA people remember the name of it. Uh, it's on the web today. But it was essentially a Bradley chassis that had sensors that went all around it and was able to navigate and maneuver on unprepared battlefields right, using its sensors. So I will say again, it becomes an emphasis area in technology, but for you future scientists in this room, do not forget, if you can dream it, you can do it. All right, so with that, I think we should yeah. probably conclude. So so if you have any additional questions, you are free to email Jerry. So uh, just let us know if you uh, like his, to have his email address. But with that, we have a little uh, presentation for your, uh, your talk. So go, go ahead. So, say a little. Thank you. I've got my black shirt that I can get chalk dust on now. Oh, sorry. Right. Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, Jerry will be down here for the next about 10 minutes.